My name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from the book. If you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions on day number one through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 190. Please turn to it. Page number 190, the very first problem that you see there in the second column. Problem number 200, that is. The problem is already on the blackboard. Here is what the problem tells us. We have a solution. Or we have a solution which contains three things. It contains soap, alcohol and water. We are told that we are to alter this solution. The solution is to be altered so that the ratio of soap to alcohol is doubled. Whatever the ratio we started out with, the ratio of soap to alcohol has to be doubled. And at the same time, soap to water has to be halved. Now the condition that we have to fulfill is that the altered solution, the altered solution must contain 100 cubic centimeter of alcohol. The question simply is, if that were to be true, if we were to meet these two conditions and we were to have 100 cubic centimeter of alcohol, how much water will it have? How much water will the final solution have? But the key here, the trick here, the trick here to deal with a problem like this, whether you have three items or four items, it doesn't matter, or five or six or 20,000 items, the key here always is to remember that when dealing with the ratios, uh, ratios of different things, try to deal with, not try to, you should deal with only two things at a time. Two things at a time, keep the, keep the third one alone, work with two items and then deal with the other two. So let's start, let's start the process here. So first we're going to deal with soap to alcohol. Soap, soap to alcohol. Soap to alcohol. Now, the original solution that is given to us, the original that is given to us, we, we never wrote it down. We have soap, not soup. We have soap, alcohol, and water in this ratio. 2 to 50 to 100. This is what we start out with. So let's let's begin our process. We are to take the ratio of soap, soap to alcohol and double it. We are to double the double the ratio. So here is our soap to alcohol. Don't worry about the water right now. Leave the water alone. As, as I said, we deal with two things at a time. Soap to alcohol, we start out with two. 250 that comes right from here 2 to 50 we start out with that that's our initial at the, at the end the final situation that we want is that this ratio has to be doubled in other words sort of two soaps we want four soap so that part is done that's it we finished that part we achieved that goal let's move on then then we have soap to water so let's do it here soap to water and we have to have the thing well, originally we have soap to water. Here's the soap again to, to to water, which is 100. And we don't want the ratio of two to 100. We want the concentration of soap to be cut in half. So instead of two to two to 100, we'll have one to 100. One to 100. Are we done? Are we done with the entire thing? Well, let's find out. We also have to have 100. 100 cubic centimeter of alcohol. But before you worry about that part, before you worry about that part, let's make this thing identical. We have, we have 2 to 50 here, or 4 to 50 here, and 1 to 100, 1 to 100. We are told, we are told that we need we need 100 gram, 100 centimeter rather, 100 centimeter cubic centimeter of alcohol. Here, the way it stands right now, the way it stands right now, we have only 50 cubic centimeter of alcohol 
we need to have 100. So let's let's meet that condition next. So multiply this by two. If you're going to multiply this by two, we have to multiply that by two. So here we have met the death condition. Now we have eight of this. Do you understand how we're doing step by step until everything fits together? Let's say we're almost there. So we have met that condition. We have 100 cubic centimeter of alcohol. We met that condition. We adjusted the concentration level here. We adjusted the concentration level here. The only last thing that is left to do here, only last thing that is left to do here is that the common element that appears here and here has to be the same amount. Has to be the same amount. The common element that appears in this scenario and that scenario is the soap. Soap is the common element. The problem is that here we only have one part of soap. Here we have eight part of soap. So we have to make that into eight in order for everything to be okay. We make this part into eight. As soon as we do that, we have to multiply this by eight. Now we have eight by eight hundred. So there you have it. Our new, our new solution that we get. I, I left no room at all for myself. Uh, we can stick it on the top. The new, new one we will get is this right here. We have eight of soap. We have one hundred cubic centimeter of alcohol, just like we were told to have. And as a result, if you're going to have 8 units of soap, 8 units of soap will require 800 units of water. That's all. We're done. And that was the question. The question is how much water we have. At the end, the answer, the answer is we will have 800 units of water, whatever the units happens to be. I think they're using cubic centimeter. It doesn't matter what the units are, whether they're using cubic centimeter or grams or liter or whatever it is. Units play no role here. That's it. We're done. We need 800 units of water. Let's go to the next one, number 201. Number 201. In 201, we are told, we are told that 75% 201 we are told 75% answered first question correctly we are also told that 55% 55% of people answered second question correctly they further go on to tell us they further go on to tell us that 20% answered neither of these questions correctly neither of these questions correctly what is the question exactly asking if 70 parts of the if the 75 percent of the class answered the first question on a certain problem correctly 55 percent answered the second question correctly 25 percent answered neither of these questions correctly what percentage of the answer what percentage answered both of them correctly though we're looking for both the percentage of both percentage of both how many how many people answered both listen forget about the percentages just in the entire process we're just going to pretend that we have 100 people okay just pretend 100 people 100 people is 100 percent so let's start our process it's a pretty straightforward simple Venn diagram problem that's what it is so we have 75 people who answered the first question correctly we have 55 people who answered second question correctly and we also told that 20 people answered neither of them correctly. Well, if 20 people are either neither of them correctly, what does that imply? 20 uh, answered answered neither correctly. Well, if 20 people answered neither correctly, what this implies is that 80 of them, 80 of them must have answered, must have answered either question number one or two or both correctly. That's what that means. If 20 people were told, if 20% answered neither of these questions correctly, then 80% of the people must have answered either question number one correctly or question number two correctly, or maybe they answered both of them correctly. And that's the whole point. The question here is how many of them answered both of them correctly. But that amount has to be 80. Keep that in mind. So let's add them up. So 5 plus 5 is 0. Uh, we get 1, 8, 30. We get 130. We get 130, but we know only 80 people out of 100, only 80 people out of 100, could have answered one or the other or both of them correctly. 130 tells us this 130 compared to 80. That implies that 50 must have 
answered both of them correctly. That's why we have a discrepancy of 50 here because those 50 are being counted, those 50 are being double counted. These 50 people are being double counted because we're counting them once as the people, as the number of people who answered question number one correctly and then we counted the same 50 people again as number of people who answered the second question correctly. These are being counted, counted twice, they are double counted. And if you want to show it in the Venn diagram, again as, as, as always, as brilliant as I am, I left no room at all for us to put down our Venn diagram. Or can we squeeze it? Let's put, put the one diagram on the top. Let's put our Venn diagram on the top. So here's our question number one, here's our question number two, one and two. So to start out with, they tell us that 75% of the people answered first one correctly. Then we, they go on to tell us that 55% answered second one correctly. 55 plus 75 adds up to 130. We know that the total of these two people, people who answer question number one correctly or question number two correctly or both of them correctly, cannot be more than 80. 80 is, 80 is what you're looking for, which means 50 of the people are being double counted. Those people who are double counted, they counted once as a part of a, uh, question one and again as part of question two. As soon as we insert any number in the, in, the, in the common area, as soon as we insert any number in the common area, we have to immediately go and adjust this figure immediately, right away, otherwise you will forget it. So if you put 50 here, this 55 has to be adjusted to 5, and this 75 has to be adjusted to 25. That tells us that out of the 100 people, or 100%, 25% of the people answered only the question number first correctly, question number one correctly, only 5% of the people answered question number two correctly, 50% of people answered both of them correctly, and therefore 20% answered neither. We did a similar problem. We did a very similar question. I'm going to do it here. Just give me one second here before I, before I do that one to get out of your way. Here, let's do it one more time. The problem that we did earlier, a few days ago. A few days ago. And that was number 186. Number 186. This one is 201. Number 186 on page 178. Turn to page number 178, uh, 76, uh, 78, 186. Here's what's going on. We had 30 applicants. We had 30 applicants. We were told that 14 had experience. We were told that 18 had degrees. We were told that 3 had neither. Same exact situation, nothing has changed. We have 30 applicants for a job. We have an opening, we have a job opening. We have received 30 applications for it, of, out of which 14 of them have experience. 14 of them have experience, 18 of them have degrees, college degrees, if you add them up you get 32, but we are told, because of the fact that we are told that out of 30 people, 3 of them have neither the experience nor a college degree, which means if 3 of them out of 30 have neither experience nor college degree, that must mean that 27 people out of those 30 people must have either a college degree or some experience or both. 27 of them. Here we are getting 32. 5 are being double counted. 5 are being double counted and the Venn diagram, we quickly we can show it again. Here is our experience. Here is our degree. We are told that 14 people have experience, so 14 goes here. We are told that 18 people have degree. We have 18 here. 14 plus 18 is 32. We know it should be 27. That tells us that 5 appears in the common area. As soon as we put 5 in the common area, we have to immediately go and adjust this figure. 18 is going to become 13 and 14 is going to become 9. 9 people out of these 30, in, out of the pool of the 30 applicants, 9 people had only the experience and no college degree. 13 out of those 30 people had, had a college degree. They were fresh out of college, but they have no, no experience. They were novices. They were tyros. Oh boy. Novice. Tyro. I don't know if you ever learned these words or not. I'll check in a second. They were tyro, they were new, they were green, do you understand? And five of them had both a college, college degree and some experience. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number 202. Number 202. Here's another one. And if it turns out that we never learned any of these words, the reason I say any of these words is because I'm, I guarantee you that if we did learn one of these words in our vocabulary lesson, then 
then we also learn the other two because they are all synonyms. So if one comes to my mind, other two also come to my mind. So either we learn all three of them or we did not learn any of them. We'll find out in a second. All I have to do is either chain, either check under N or check under T. I think T would be quicker because T would have fewer words beginning with T. Oh, we did learn it. What the hell? Vocabulary, day 44. And I just want to double check even though I claim that we must have learned the other two. I just want to check 44. There you go. Day 44. If you're interested in working on your vocabulary, just type in GMAT vocabulary words. Day number 44 and you will learn these three words along with some other words. Here is another word there, incognito, we learned before. Let's move on. Number 202. 202. In 202 we are told that we have a line whose equation is y equals to x. And we are told that this line is perpendicular. Perpendicular. And this line is a perpendicular bisector of AB which is not shown which is not given and we are told that x-axis is the again perpendicular bisector of BC again it's not the line BC is not shown all we are told is that all we are told is that the coordinates of A are 2 and 3. Let's see what we can do. I do not know why I always do that. Because in a situation like this, it will be, have a, it will, it will be nice to have a nice big picture so that we can use the whole, whole blackboard. One more time, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to erase it. So we have a line whose equation is y is equal to x. The line whose equation is y is equal to x, I hope that you're able to see right away, it's a 45 degree line going through the origin when x is 1, y is 1, when, y, when, when x is 2, y is 2, when x is negative 17, y is negative 17. It's a 45 degree line. And that line, we are told, is a perpendicular bisector of the line AB. All we know about the line segment AB is that the point A has coordinates of 2 and 3. I'm going to raise everything. And similarly, we know that x-axis is a perpendicular bisector of BC. Let's do it together. I need the room. All the action is going to take place in, the, in, this, in this quadrant and this quadrant, so let's not worry about that part. So, first let's draw the line uh, y is equal to uh, x. So, here we go. Here is our line. When x is 1, y is 1. When x is 2, y is 2. When x is 3, y is 3. And so on and so forth. When x is 4, y is 4. There is our line. And this line has an equation of y is equal to x. Of course, it's a 45 degree line. We are told that this line is a perpendicular bisector of the segment AB. All we know about the line segment AB is not shown to us. All we know is that point A, we are told, has a coordinates of 2, 3. Point A, we are told, has, has coordinates of 2 and 3. So let's, let's locate it, shall we? 2 and 3. 2 and 3, right here. This is our point A. A is 2 and 3. Now what does perpendicular bisector mean? I never explained to you. Perpendicular bisector simply means exactly what it says. So if you have a line here, if I tell you that from here to here is 6 units long, then perpendicular bisector means, first of all, it has to be cut in half. Bisect means it has to be exactly in half. And perpendicular means it has to cut at 90 degrees. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you had a line like this going through a 3, if you had a line like this that goes through like this, that line is not a perpendicular bisector. Even though it goes at 3, it is not a perpendicular, it is a bisector, but it's not a perpendicular bisector because perpendicular means it has to make a 90 degree. That's what we need here. We need to make, we need to, we need, we need a line that is going to be a perpendicular bisector. This line, so that line y is equal to x is a perpendicular bisector. And that one is going to be here. See, it's very simple. This is one unit up. This is from here to here. It's one unit up. So it's a, instead of going one unit up, we go one unit to the right, right here. And that's our line. That's our point B. That's the line. 
that line A to B now is cut in half and it makes a 90 degree angle. It makes a 90 degree angle. Let me put it in a different color. Makes it. We're not done yet. The question is what, what are the coordinates of C? Second thing we know, second thing that we are told is that x-axis again is a perpendicular bisector of BC. x-axis x-axis is a perpendicular bisector of BC. Perpendicular bisector of BC. So B, as we know, is two units up. One, one, and two. From here, one and two. And since it's going to cut in half, the line cannot be more than four units. If from here, from, from the here to here is two units, and since x-axis is going to cut in half, it has to be only four units long, so which means it, says it goes down two. That's it, we're done. This is our line segment BC. This is our line segment BC. Let me put it in a little bit different way so we can see it. This is our line segment BC. And the question simply was, what are the coordinates of point C? Well, coordinates of point C are very simple. This was, this was 1, 2, 3. So this is 3. And positive 2. C is going to have the same x coordinate as this one, which is 3. Except, since this is 2, this is going to be negative 2. Because x-axis cuts in half, and this is a perpendicular bisector. The coordinates of point C are... The coordinates of point C are... 3 and negative 2. And that's all. That was the end of it. That was the end of that page. We're not going to start a new page right now. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.